So this guy wants you to think that he has it all. From the cars to the clothes, success, fans. Yeah, man, um, about to go get this thousand dollars out for the um for the fans, man. Really, I'm gonna take out twenty thousand, man. Just to show people, you feel me? I'm I'm on a whole different level with this, man. But you can't put me in the same category as the others. And he's right. He cannot be put in the same category as others. And you'll find out why later. This is Kwame Wilson. And the way that he earned this money will have you mind blown. You feel me, man? I don't play no games. Bro. I don't got no problem with giving back, man. I'm the only one out here with a show that's actually giving back. Now, like with every story, we have to take it back to the beginning, where it all started with his mother, Yolanda Holmes. What is a mother? To me, a mother is someone who loves their child unconditionally. And that's the kind of mother that Yolanda Holmes was. She loved her son more than anything and literally would give the shirt off of her back in order to make sure that he was okay. But the way that he repaid her was in one of the worst ways. Today, we're going to talk about the case of Yolanda Holmes and the betrayal that she ultimately had to deal with from one of her very own. Yolanda Holmes was born in the Windy City of Chicago in February of 1967. And the community described her as someone who was beautiful, generous, funny, very driven, and very smart. In fact, she was so driven that she went on to open her own business, a hair salon. And that hair salon was very successful. However, that's where her generosity comes in. See, she had the option to keep that business open merely for profit and that's it, but she didn't. She would actually close the hair salon down multiple times a year to throw get-togethers and community functions for the youth so they could have a place to go to that was safe, that was fun, that was monitored, and really just to kind of give the kids of the community a refuge and something to look forward to, which was wonderful. But also, she would take it upon herself to provide the children of her community with backpacks full of school supplies every school year didn't matter who if you needed it she'd give it to you because that's just how she was and that's how generous she was now if Yolanda was that generous with her community just imagine how she was with her son Kwameen Wilson he was the light of her life and her only son and she was willing to do absolutely anything to make sure that he was successful and Colmaine's father was actually in jail. He was incarcerated on a murder charge. So she didn't want her son to go down that same path as him. So she ensured that she worked hard so he would not have to struggle and wouldn't have to turn to the streets for money. So he had the best cars, he had the best clothes, his hair was always nice. He had access to everything that he could have ever wanted because of her. And that was her way of loving him and also supporting all of his aspirations. He wanted to be a rap star. He wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be um, an actor. He wanted to do all of these different things. But nonetheless, she loved her son and wanted him to thrive. And that's how she felt that she could help him. And that's completely okay because at the end of the day, her intentions were pure. Now, I'll allow you to be the judge of his work and his acting skills. I mean, when I look in your eyes, I see joy, pure innocence. I just want you to be better than all your friends. Be better than your circumstances. Let me address Vito real fast. You right, Vito. I did lead a game to play father for my family, if that's what you want to call it. Vito. What you don't realize is, compared to me, you nothing. You should be ashamed of yourself. You got 10 kids. You don't even respect them enough to take care of them. My seeds are defected and doomed before they leave my body. I'm a seed of hell. 
I bleed hell. And we all not brothers, but we all come from the same womb, the vagina of hell. So I don't understand why you trying to curate heaven in the world. You made a living hell. Huh? Now his acting was not my cup of tea, but everything in his life was going to change September 2nd of 2012. It was a little after five in the morning and detectives responded to the 1000 block of West Montrose after receiving a call of shots fired. That's where Yolanda lived. And she was there that evening with her on and off again boyfriend by the name of Curtis. Now, we all know those relationships, right? On again, off again. And no matter how much you guys go apart, you tend to always end up back together. And at this point, her and Curtis were back together. And things were going well. In fact, the previous night, they went out, they had a great time, and they just headed to bed. But unfortunately, only one of them was going to wake up the next morning. And it was not Yolanda. Yolanda Holmes was pronounced dead in her apartment that morning. Now, the only other person that the police could confirm that were there was her on and off again boyfriend, Curtis. And in these cases, one of the first people that police always look at is a significant other. So Curtis was automatically considered a suspect. Now, Curtis claims that he was asleep and he heard Yolanda on the phone for a quick phone call. After the phone call, she went to sleep and there was nothing else for a little while. But then he was awoken by an intruder that was attacking Yolanda and he was attacking her fatally. Now, this is a woman that he loved, so he did what he could to fight the intruder. But in the process, he sustained injuries that were not life-threatening but they were pretty substantial. However, he said that all of a sudden, after they fought, the intruder ran off, but he left behind some evidence. He left behind a shattered firearm and also an earbud, a wired earbud that had been ripped from his headphones. In addition to that, there was a knife missing from the kitchen. Now, when the police arrived, they were able to see all of this including the lifeless body of Yolanda. However, when they interviewed Curtis, they found out that he didn't call 911 right away. And on top of that, he actually took time to clean up the crime scene before they came. So these reasons made them extremely suspicious of him. As all of this was going on and the police were investigating, including CCTV footage. And the footage showed what looked like a resident with a laundry bag and some earbuds on walking into the building shortly before the murder and coming out a little bit after. And they noticed that that person that had the earbuds on seemed to be walking out with a broken or missing earbud, kind of matching the one they found in the apartment. So that was definitely something that they kept in mind. But nonetheless, police didn't have much to go off of, but they kept their eye on Curtis. And one of the things that didn't really help Curtis's case was the fact that he did take a lie detector test and he didn't do very well on the test, but he was adamant that he did not hurt her. In addition to that, Curtis was calling the police almost daily, asking for an update now. He could be doing that for a couple of reasons. He could do it because maybe he was in fact the culprit and he wanted to see where they were in the investigation. Or genuinely, he could be telling the truth and he wanted justice for her. But nonetheless, he was keeping open communication with the police. So other than the mysterious owner of this broken headphone piece and Yolanda's boyfriend, the police really didn't have much to go off of. So they started looking in different angles. And one thing that they looked at was Yolanda's phone records. And they saw that Yolanda had two phone lines in her name. One that she clearly used herself, but another that they know couldn't have been used by her because 
the phone line was active right before, during, and right after her demise. So they found this to be odd and they started digging into this. And lo and behold, what would they find? They found that the second phone line was actually being used by her son, Kwame. And he was using the phone directly before, during, and after this crime took place. This was something that they were suspicious about and they wanted to find out more. Detectives were also able to confirm that the person Kwame was speaking to on his phone line was someone by the name of Eugene Spencer. And Eugene used to be Kwame's neighbor at a different apartment complex sometime in the past. So they wanted to reach out to Kwame, but for some reason they couldn't find him. He was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, you guys remember those clips I showed you in the beginning of this video of him throwing money into the air, going into the bank, putting those modified doors on that Mustang, which should be a crime in itself, etc. That money was not his. That was money that he inherited after his mother passed away. In fact, Colmaine emptied out her bank accounts after she passed. He also inherited money from a life insurance plan that she left for him because, again, she was a good mother and she loved her son. So that horrible movie production, the music videos, the cars, the clothes, the shoes, the businesses, that was his mom's money. So when the police bring Kwame into the station, they say, hey, we've been looking for you. We've been trying to get in touch with you. We've had a lot of questions for you about your mother's demise. Kwame then says, you know what? That's crazy because I've also been trying to get in touch with you guys and I just haven't been able to get through. Guys, this is the Chicago Police Department. You mean to tell me that he's been trying to get in touch with them this whole time over a year but was but he wasn't successful no that's suspicious it's very clear that he did not want to be found but the question is why didn't he want to be found the detectives talked to him about the phone line and also they brought up the name eugene spencer and at first he said yeah i don't really know who that is but the police are skeptical because they know that Eugene lived right above Kwame at one point. But then Kwame picks up on this and he says, oh, actually I know him by his street name, Boo. And the police pull up the CCTV footage from the night of the crime and they show him the person that was seen walking in and out of the apartment that morning. And of course Kwame says, yeah, that's Boo, that's Eugene. So why was your acquaintance Eugene seen coming in and out of your mother's apartment building that night why did it look like he lived there when we all know that he did not live there what is going on and at this point the police are hitting him hard with question upon question so he finally cracked and Kwame admits that he set his mother up for a robbery because he needed money and instead of going out and working for that money, like many other people do, he decided he wanted to rob his mother. He claimed that it was just supposed to be a robbery and his mom's life wasn't supposed to be taken. I mean, what did his mom have? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars in the house that night? Like, no. It's clear that in order for him to be able to access her money, she would have to be deceased. Now, in the meantime, the police, they have to find Eugene. They need to find him fast. They need to question him because they're now getting closer to closing this case and understanding what happened. They find Eugene and they think that Eugene's not going to talk. They think he's going to lawyer up right away. But no, he talked. He spilled. He said, yes, I was the one that went into her apartment complex that night. night. I was the one who killed her. But I was thrown off because there was a man in there. That's Curtis. See, Kwame wasn't expecting Curtis to be in there. Now, earlier in the night, Curtis reported that Yolanda had a brief phone call that was really, really quick before they went to bed. And that was it. He didn't think anything of it. That phone call was actually Kwame saying, hey, mom, can I come over really quick? And she said, yeah, that's fine. In reality, Kwame was the mastermind of everything. 
because the police asked Eugene, Eugene, how'd you get into that apartment? Kwame told me to go in and hit the code. And when that happens, Yolanda would come onto the speaker to see who it was. Kwame told Eugene just to cough like this. <coughs> and then, of course, Yolanda would think that it was Kwame, so she would let him in. And that's exactly what happened. So he goes upstairs and she has no idea what is awaiting her. Now, as all of this is happening, Kwame is on the phone with Eugene and he tells Eugene, make sure that B is dead in regards to his mother. He wanted to ensure that the job was done right so he could get all of her money. Now, the police also asked Eugene, Eugene, how did you get the firearm? Kwame gave it to me. Kwame gave him the firearm. Kwame gave him the code. Kwame called his mother beforehand. And then he tells Eugene what to do when he goes to the speaker. This is all Kwame. And one last thing, Eugene needed a ride. Kwame didn't want to give him a ride because he wanted to be hands off with this, right? Kwame asks his girlfriend, Loriana Johnson, to take Eugene to his mom's house just to drop something off really quick. So she does that. She claims she doesn't know what happened. She just thought, okay, I'm going to drive him, drop him off, wait for him, and then we'll go back. So she does just that. She drops off Eugene. He goes into the apartment. He does this deed, and then he comes back. But when he comes back, his clothes are changed. And Loriana said that she smelled the odor and the stench of blood. And she asked Eugene, hey, what is that smell? Like, what, what, what is that, right? And finally, Eugene admitted to her in the car, Kwame made me do it. But she never went to the police. She never went to the police with that knowledge. That's why I think that she was in on it. But she claims she wasn't. Now, what was the motive for this? It was money. Kwame wanted the business. He wanted the cars. He wanted the money. He wanted it all right then and there. So he approaches Eugene and says, hey, I'll pay you $4,200 if you do this for me. And Eugene says, okay, I'll do it. You want to know how much Eugene ended up getting after all of this? $70. So that's why I feel like by the time everything was said and done, Eugene had no issue throwing Kwame into it. So after everything is said and done, Kwame is sentenced to 99 years in prison. Eugene receives life. And I want to say the girlfriend received around seven years. She's actually out of prison now. But yeah, this man, he literally arranged for his own loving mother to be eliminated from this world for money. Thank goodness that there's justice. And Yolanda, rest in peace. <laughs>